please stand for the reading of God's Word. Mr. Nick McDonald's uh, message today is entitled, Unworry. It's taken from the text of Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, and is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Morning, Cornerstone. Glad to be with you today. As Richard said earlier, you sent me off to seminary, and so now I'm here, and this is the most expensive 30 minutes of your life coming up here. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Uh, We're talking about worry today. Has anyone here ever, let's see, how about last 24 hours? Have you worried about something? Go ahead. Be nice and proud. Okay. All right. Yeah, I chose this partially because it's very applicable to everybody. It's super easy to preach because we all worry. Um, But when I say applicable, I'm probably not saying it in the way you typically think of it. Because what we often want from the Bible is, okay, Jesus, give me 10 steps to financial peace. Well, Jesus has just said a few verses earlier There's no such thing as financial peace. You can be a peaceful person, but it's not going to be because of your finances. It's not going to happen. Say, all right, Jesus, give me five steps to fix my children. Okay? And God says, have you read the Old Testament? I did not fix my children. Okay? I I don't do that. Okay? I, I can't tell you how to fix your circumstances. I can tell you how to fix you. All right? We're like, um, we're like people who come to the doctor with a, with a tumor, and we say, Jesus, can you put a Band-Aid on that? And Jesus says, no, we need to do surgery on that. We've got to get deeper. That's what Jesus is doing this morning when he talks to us about anxiety. He's getting to the root of it. Anxiety is a symptom, all right? It's like an engine light that comes on. It means something under the hood is not operating well. And that thing that's under the hood for Jesus is the way we think about God. It's the way we think. It's, it's our, um, you know, when you wake up in the morning, things pop into your head. You, you never know what you're going to think about first thing in the morning. Those things just come like bubbles from a bath. They're just there, all right? For the Christian, Jesus says, you can't just let those things pop into your head. You've got to take them down and you've got to examine them and say, huh, is this right? Does this align with the gospel? Is this the way that Jesus wants me to think? So what Jesus is going to do in this text this morning is he's going to teach you how to argue with yourself. All right? Do you understand what I mean when I say that? Sometimes your brain is going to pop up with stuff, and you're going to start to feel anxious, and Jesus is teaching you how to sit down with yourself and say, okay, no, 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 no. That's not the way we think about this. We're going to think about this differently. We're going to align these thoughts with the kingdom of God, because that's the way you deal with your anxiety. And to that end, I've got four uns, all right? 
four little arguments that start with un that Jesus is going to give us. I picked this up. I, I grew up at Shepherd of the Lakes, so I don't know why, but in the Lutheran church, they alliterate everything. Everything's alliterated, so I'm following my family tradition in that. So everything's alliterated this morning. The first thing that Jesus tells us in verse 25, to tell yourself when you are worried and you're anxious, is that worry is unfulfilling. Now, that may seem really obvious to you. Well, duh, worry is unfulfilling. Of course it is. But if you think about it, you chose to worry. You chose the thinking that led to worry. Jesus says in verse 25, Is not the body more than clothing? Is not life more than food? Or the soul is it not more than food? Jesus is saying, you know, a lot of the time when you worry... It's because you've adopted a materialistic outlook on life. Food and clothing, that's all there is to live for. When I was out in Massachusetts a few weeks ago, I saw a sign out out in Rockport on the ocean, and it said, um, you know, who needs a purpose in life when you can dress well and eat well? And it was, I don't think that person was being serious. I think it was sort of a coy way of saying, this is how I think sometimes, okay? I think like this, honestly. And we think like that too, don't we? We think like that. But Jesus is saying, listen, if you are concerned about food and clothing and shelter, I'm concerned about that too, all right? But when you are anxious, that means that the concern over material things has gone from priority number three to priority number one. Okay, when Jesus taught us to pray earlier in this chapter, what do we start with? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, priorities. And then, give us a stay our daily bread. That's fourth on the list. Jesus is saying that when we worry, so oftentimes it's because we've taken the material things and put them up here. There's a, a doctor, his name is Paul Brand, and he did the first few years of his residency out in India. And um, India is not a Christian country by any means but they're also not a materialistic country. What he found was, when he was working with leprosy patients, that as he worked with them, they were not nearly as anxious as his American patients. And when he returned to the States, he said, okay, we have all these medical resources. We have far less disease. We don't see lepers walking around Brighton, Michigan that I know of, all right? We don't see that. But What he said was, when I returned to the States, I found that people in America were so much more anxious about those things than the rest of the world. Do you know that we're the most anxious, most depressed nation in the world? I mean, statistically, we're the most anxious and depressed nation. We're also one of the wealthiest. Why is that? It's because we've taken material things and we've said they're number one. And guess what? Moth destroys them. Thieves break in and steal. Those things, they come and they go. Jesus says our anxiety so many times comes from that mindset. If you're here this morning and maybe you have some questions about Christianity or maybe you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian, I bet you showed up today because instinctively you know that. You know that there's something more to life than food and clothing. You may not know what that is, but you know it. A few months ago, uh, the New York Times came out with an article by a Brown University professor, and he was bemoaning the lack of uh, training in the arts in schools. And he was saying, we're boiling everything down to math and science. Everything's math and science. One of his sentences in this article caught my eye. What he says is, um, you know, uh, we're teaching kids how to make a better GPS system, right? GPS, it gets you where you want to go. It makes things efficient. Here's what he said. Um, GPS provides us with the most efficient and direct route to a destination, but it presupposes we know where we're going. (laughs) Finding an address is one thing. Finding one's way in life is another. This is not from a Christian perspective, but what he's saying is Efficiency, materialism, is not enough to fulfill the psychic landscape that God has put inside of us. You have that. I have that. 
And what we are made for is not just food and clothing. We are made for the kingdom of God, the mission of God, the restoration of the goodness of creation. That's what you're designed for. And if that's what you're looking for, that's what you find in Jesus alone. Worry is unfulfilling. So Christian, how do you pray? How do you pray? Taking your anxieties to God is good, but what's first on the list? The kingdom. The kingdom. You can train yourself into thinking that way through prayer. Worry is unfulfilling. But secondly, Jesus says, worry is unobservant. That's what he says in verse 26 and verse 28 through 30. He's talking about the birds of the air and the, the flowers of the field. Actually, the word he uses here when he says, look at the birds of the air, it's, the verb is a little more intense than that. It's actually saying, continually come under them like, like a, a pupil would to its, his masters, come under their teaching all the time. Be, be observing them continually over and over and over again. This is what we see in the Old Testament, that David the psalmist, what is he doing? He loves God's word, but he also loves what? God's world. He loves God's world. He goes out, he looks at it, and he thinks, who is my creator? Oh, we don't do that a lot, do we? In fact, this probably sounds a little bit trite to us. Go look at the birds, go look at the flowers. Jesus sounds like a hippie, frankly, in this passage. But <laughs> he's, what he's saying is actually really profound. He's saying, God has designed this world to tell you something about himself. Okay, this is, this is my spin on it. And if you sit in front of a computer all day, <laughs> and if you sit in front of a television all day, and you get all of the worst events in the world at your doorstep in a 30-minute block of time, you're going to be anxious. Is that surprising to you? It's not surprising to me that you'd be anxious. I was a communications major. We would study this. As people would grow older, they'd spend more time watching the television, and guess what? Their view of the world would sink and sink and sink and sink until they were afraid to go outside. And you may say, well, the world has sunk and sunk and sunk and sunk, but just think about it. Think about it. Is that the way God designed you? If you're an anxious person, one of the best things that you can do is not only read your scripture, but go for a walk, right? And if you're struggling, you just feel anxious, you go to your spouse, you say, honey, I need to go for a walk. And if your spouse says, why? You say, because Jesus told me to, so I'm going, okay? I'm leaving. That's okay, you can do that. Anxiety comes from us not observing or thinking about God's world. We're not thinking about the place that God has created. Look at the birds of the air, Jesus says. Look at the flowers of the field. The birds of the air, by the way, they work for what they get, okay? They work. But they don't think ahead. That doesn't mean you can't think ahead. What Jesus is saying, they don't even have the same capacity to work that you do, and they're fine, okay? They're fine. And they don't cock their heads up and expect worms to drop down, but they're okay. They're really okay, all right? They can't think ahead, but your Heavenly Father cares for them. The flowers in the field, I was saying earlier, I know that this doesn't, this is, this is better uh, preached in North Carolina where I come from because we have flowers in the field, and most of the time here, you know, you go outside, you got to dig it out from the snow. And, okay, let's see, what is, what is Jesus trying to tell me here? I don't know. But what Jesus is saying about those flowers is he's saying, look, how much did they pay at Macy's for that? Well, that's better than anything Macy's can do. Come on, that's, that's incredible. Your father clothes them. How much more valuable are you? You know, kids, if your parents came home and they fed your, your dog, Sparky, and they fed your fish, Mr. Bubbleface, okay, are you gonna sit on the couch and say, Dad, you fed my pets, but I know you're not going to give me dinner. I know you're not going to feed me. I know you're not. It's kind of weird, right? That's what Jesus is saying we do when we worry. He says, go look at the pets outside. I fed the pets. I'm going to feed you, right? You're my child. It's so funny. When people come to Jesus throughout the gospel, and they have these worries, these legitimate concerns, how are we going to feed all these people? How are we going to get bread? What you expect Jesus to say is, I don't know. I, 
you know, I, that's totally legitimate concern. I, I hope they've got it figured out up there because I, I don't know what's going on. But what Jesus says is, he says, what are you doing? <laughs> you, you have a heavenly father. How are you concerned about this? This doesn't make any sense. That's how Jesus treats our anxiety. I fed the pets so you're not being observant. Go out. Think about it. Third, Jesus says, worry is unfruitful. Verse 27, which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? Okay, that's a good question, so I'm going to ask it to you. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your span of life? Raise your hand. Okay. There's, a, um, there's an old story uh, about a man who was leaving London, and he saw this black cloaked figure. And on his way out of London, he sees the black cloaked figure, and he says, who are you? I don't know who you are. And the figure turns to him and says, I'm deaf. He says, okay, what are you doing here? He says, oh, I came to take a dozen lives. And he says, well, can I go warn everybody? And he says, yeah, sure. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but go ahead. He goes into the city, and he gives him 24 hours, and he's you know, running around like Chicken Little and saying, you know, death is coming, death is coming. 24 hours later, he starts to leave the city, and he sees death again, all right? And um, he's just talked to the coroner who said, we actually had 150 people die today. So he says to death, I thought, I thought you were going to take a dozen lives. And death says, I did, and you worried everyone else to death. <laughs> Isn't that true? I mean, worry never accomplishes anything. In fact, right now, close your eyes, close your eyes. Picture your nightmare candidate coming into office. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Get as apocalyptic as you want, all right? Think about it. Okay, now stop. What did you just accomplish? What, what did you just accomplish? Nothing. Did you add an hour to your life through that? The doctor, doctor recommended activity? No, not. Nah right? It's not good. It doesn't do anything. In fact, let's do the math. If that person does not come into office, you just worried once for nothing. And if they do, you worry twice when you only need to worry once. See? It doesn't, make, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying worry is an overestimation of your lordship of your life. Do you hear that? All right? Worry is overestimating your own sovereignty. If, if, um, if prayer is taking your cares to God, worry is taking your cares to yourself. It's actually a form of pride. And what shall I do about this? I'm in charge. What am I going to do? There's a little exercise that I give to people sometimes, and it's, um, it's called the circle of concern. And what you do is you draw a little circle, and you draw a big circle around it. In the little circle are all the things that you have responsibility for. In the big circle are all the things God has responsibility for alone. It's amazing how many things we pull from that circle down to our circle of concern. We choose to be concerned about them. You can pray about those things, but to worry about them is to overestimate what you can do about them. Lay them before the Lord. That's all. And some things you got to do something about. Okay, sometimes if you're anxious, you just got to make an action list and do it. All right? But most of the time, our worry is in that second circle. Worry is unfruitful. But finally, Jesus says, worry is unbecoming. It's unbecoming. For a child of God, worry is not appropriate. All right? Jesus is not saying life won't be painful. He promises that life will be painful, but what he's saying is, why would you add worry to an already painful life? Why would you? He's, he's comparing the Christian to the pagan in verse 31 and 32. Don't be anxious about saying, what shall we eat or drink or where? For the pagans seek after all these things. Saying, when you worry, you look to the world just like the world. All right? When you post uh, things on Facebook about how terrible 
the world is and how worried you are about it, guess what you look like? Do you look like a strong Christian who's standing up for what's right? No, you look like an orphan. You look like someone who doesn't know God or doesn't know that God knows them. You don't look like a son or a daughter when you do that. You look like a pagan. See, for the Christian, we know that every single thing that happens, okay, listen to this, whether it's painful or pleasant, every single thing that happens in our life, did God know that it was going to happen beforehand? Okay? Did he choose to prevent the thing that happened to you beforehand? Could he have? Could he have chosen to prevent it? Yes. And if he didn't, what does that mean? It means that God allowed it into your life because he loves you better than you do. You know that? I wouldn't choose the painful things that have happened to me in my life. I wouldn't have chosen that. I wouldn't have. But you know why that is? It's because I'm not as interested in my happiness as God is. He's more interested in my happiness than I am, and so he allows me to go through more painful circumstances than I would. Because when God looks at those circumstances, he says, yes, that is good for this person right now and will be for their happiness. That's the promise of Scripture, that if you've been chosen and predestined before the foundation of the world, you will become in the image of God's Son, Jesus. His happiness will be your happiness. And that is the way that God is orchestrating your life. I have a friend who's in the UK, and um, a few months ago he was rifling through some things in the attic, and he found a letter uh, to one of his aunts, who was a really sickly young girl. And um, as he read through the letter, he read through the whole thing, he saw at the bottom it was signed, William Wilberforce, great slave abolitionist. One of the things Wilberforce wrote to my friend's aunt was, she was very sick and in pain, he says this, I just wonder how many of us would dare say this to a sick young girl today. He says, um, God would not let me suffer pain if he were not persuaded it would be for my benefit. And I will therefore receive all and submit to all he orders for me as that which is sure to be more than made up to me. Do you believe that, Christian? Do you believe that every second of your life God has said yes to that second because he has chosen it for you so that he can more than make it up to you. You believe that? That's what it means to live like a child of God. It means to believe that whatever happens, painful or pleasant, God has hand-selected that for my good and his glory. You know, Jesus, we said earlier, is never anxious in his life. He's never anxious not about food and clothing. He was anxious about one thing. In fact, he was so anxious that he sweat drops of blood and anxiety. What was he anxious about? It was the one moment where he faced the wrath of his heavenly Father, where he's bearing that wrath. Christian, the one thing that you should be anxious about, Jesus has been anxious about on your behalf. You understand that? The one thing that you ought to be anxious about, God's wrath, his punishment, his displeasure, Jesus took that. He took that, all right? If you don't know Jesus this morning, there's a reason why you're anxious, because you know that you're not right with God. You know that. And so Jesus is inviting you in. He's inviting you in. He says, take that anxiety, cast it on me. I will take care of it right now. I invite you to do that. Christian, life as a child of God doesn't mean a painless life, but it does mean a life that trusts our Heavenly Father. On my way home from work sometimes, uh, my son waits for me at the gas station, and uh, my wife is there with him. He's not there by himself. It's <laughs> really irresponsible. So they're together. And on my way home, I'll, I'll drive by, and sometimes, if I'm in a really good mood, I'll let him sit on my lap and put his hands on the wheel, all right? And then I let him drive through the driveway back to our apartment. Um, is he anxious about that? No. 
because he knows that I didn't put him on the wheel because I need a chauffeur to get back to my house, right? I didn't need him to do that. What am I doing? I'm inviting him to participate with me as my son. His hands are here. My hands are right here. Hey, Christian, whatever responsibility God has given you in your life, he's placed your hands here, not because he needs a chauffeur, not because he needs you to drive for him, but so that you can sit on his lap. His hands are right here. They're right here. He's steering. You're participating. He's steering. That's true for every second and every moment of your life. So you can trust in your Heavenly Father. Anxiety is unfulfilling. It's unobservant. It's unfruitful. It's unbecoming. But trust in our Heavenly Father is not only for our good. It is a testimony to a watching world. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your good word. We thank you that you steal away our anxieties through your son. Lord Jesus, we are so happy to be sons and daughters of God this morning, to trust in your good promises, to know that all things work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purposes, that we might be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. That is true for everyone who trusts in you this morning. And for those who don't yet know you, I pray that they would place their faith in Christ now. We pray for that in your name. Amen.